Good morning, everyone, and welcome to one more lecture of uh, otolaryngology (ENT). And today we are going to discuss tonsillitis. And before discussing tonsillitis, like uh, in the last lecture, I was talking about uh, the <clears throat> anatomy and physiology of the tonsils. So. When we discuss, uh, when we are talking about tonsillitis, so remember, like, uh, it, like, mo what we are discussing is about palatine tonsils, right? I told you about welder ring. What is that? There is lingual ton lingual tonsils. There is uh, uh, this palatine tonsils. There is uh, other lymphoid tissue as well as there is adenoids. So, <clears throat> palatine tonsils are two in number. Each one of them is ovu. <laughs> oval in shape and they are collection of lymphoid tissue and like they have the anterior and posterior pillars and uh, what else it have two surfaces the medial one and the lateral one and two poles the upper pole and lo lower pole so uh, I, I told you talk about the crypts they have 12 to 14 uh, they have 12 to 15 crypts right and one of the crypt like uh, which is in the middle which is the deep one is also called as the crypta magna like this is the diagram to show you when you open the mouth so you can see the tonsils and there is like the uh, two pillars you can say on one of the side you know the arches uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> palatoglossal and palatopharyngeal arches right we have discussed this thing before so uh, this one is covered by uh, epithelium stratified squamous epithelium non cretinized type and uh, uh, like what is the importance of these scripts by the way these scripts may be filled with cheesy material sometimes containing consisting of epithelial cells bacteria and food debris and which we can express outside by putting pressure on the anterior pillar. So the lateral surface, you know, here there is what you can say the soft areolar tissue. Okay. And the lateral surface of the tonsils, there is a well-defined fibrous capsule. And uh, <clears throat> this is the division of the plane, you know when we do tonsillectomy so talking about the bed of the tonsils you can see the important structures which like this is the mouth and this is these are the tonsils so what what is making the bed of the tonsils or what is lateral to the lateral uh, side of the tonsils you can see <clears throat> number one is of course like the loose areolar or uh, areolar tissue then there is superior constrictor muscle uh, sorry, uh, there is a para tonsillar vein. Okay. Then there is superior constrictor muscle, this one, number third. Okay. Then there is tyloglossus muscle. Then there is glossopharyngeal nerve, this one. This is tyloglossus muscle, and this is glossopharyngeal nerve and then there is uh, facial artery is also making the bed of the uh, tonsils as well as a uh, medial pterygoid muscle this one okay angle of the mandible and this one should be uh, <coughs> uh, this one is uh, angle of the mandible then there is slivery glands okay and uh, so these th these are all what you can say make the make up making up the bed of uh, like the structures which are lateral to the lateral uh, border or la lateral surface of the tonsils so we, co we call it as bed of the tonsil okay so superior constrictor muscle siloglossus muscle glossopharyngeal nerve styler process so 
of course like uh, why because you know tonsillectomy is a very important surgery so we must know what is lateral to this okay so and i told you i talk about what you can say the blood supply of the tonsils as well in the previous lecture tonsillar branch of the facial artery then as there is ascending fringe ascending pharyngeal artery from external carotid there is ascending palatine which is also a branch of uh, facial artery dorsal lingua branch of lingual artery and there is descending palatine artery of the maxillary artery so the tonsil is supplied by the external carotid artery and the veins drain into the paratonsillar vein join common facial vein and then pharyngeal plexus and the lymphatic drainage to upper deep cervical lymph nodes particularly the jugular digastric tonsillar node situated below the angle of mandible so uh, this is how it is supplied okay uh, so uh, glossopharyngeal and trigeminal are the nerves you know which innervate the uh, which innervate the tonsils so i already talked about the immunity in the previous lecture right it provides the local immunity at, as well as i told you that like provide a surveillance mechanism and the tonsils are most active from 5 4 to 10 years of age and after that they are not so active and that's the reason whenever like there is need of tonsillectomy you know it is done at this at this age okay so to now <coughs> What is the importance of this topic? Tonsillitis is one of the very important topic of in otolaryngeology or ENT. Why? Because um, it is so common. Okay, in the many people, it's a very common infection. Uh, many of the patients they present with tonsillitis, so 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 common, and many of the babies, you know, the uh, uh, children, especially uh, school-going children, by the way, four to ten years of age. So this uh, school going uh, age group goes, uh, undergoes what you can say tonsillectomy surgery, right? Uh, why? Because of uh, repeated infections in the tonsils. So uh, tonsillitis and infectious pharyngitis, you know, uh, they are more or less the same things, you can say. Because uh, the inflammation of the tonsils... Uh, and the inflammation of the pharynx because they are in so much close proximity that uh, uh, most of the time you know they they occur together so uh, these this is a school going going age group you know which undergoes tonsillect tons, tonsillectomy most of the time so what is tonsillectomy like tonsillitis and what we are studying right now is acute tonsillitis and then we will go for uh, to study um, chronic tonsillitis uh, so as I told you that uh, there is a surface epithelium uh, which is continuous with the oropharyngeal lining okay and there is crypts also okay and there is lymphoid tissues also okay uh, so acute infection of the tonsils is very 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 common and as you know, as you can see, uh, these are the types of acute tonsillitis. See, acute superficial tonsillitis. It is also called as acute catheteral tonsillitis. Then there is acute follicular, acute parenchymatous, and acute membranous. It's not so hard to understand this thing. See, uh, whenever it occurs uh, in relation to the pharyngitis, you know, it is called as acute superficial, which is just related to the epithelium right so that's what i'm saying you know acute superficial or acute um, catheteral uh, is the same thing it it is a part it is a part of you can say acute pharyngitis uh, like pharyngitis is a very 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 common infection which which affect a lot of people and you will see a lot of patients if especially if you're a gp okay so, as the epithelium of the tonsil is uh, same like the oropharyngeal epithelium, 
So whenever there is pharyngitis, the, the patient is present with like tonsillitis as well. So this is acute superficial tonsillitis. Then there is acute follicular tons tonsillitis. Now here come the crypts. So when the infection, they, they spread into the crypts. So the crypts, they become, they, they, they become full with pus. Okay. And when we see the tonsils, you know, we see yellow spots. Like this, you know. This is acute catheteral or superficial. See, there is redness all over the pharynx and all over the tonsils, right? So it is acute superficial or acute catheteral. If you will see over here what's going on here. Now the infection is gone into the crypts and the crypts are full of pussy material and we can see these small small spots over the tonsils. Okay. So this is acute follicular. Uh, parenchymatous simply when all the tonsils tissues are affected so the tonsils become uniformly enlarged and they appear red in color. That is called as acute parenchymatous. And what is membrane is simply the tonsils is covered with uh, a membrane on the surface of uh, on the surface of the tonsils. Okay. Uh, what happened is basically you know that the pus which is coming out from this individual crypts you know it joined together and appear like a membrane we call it as acute membranous okay so this is the presentation of <coughs> don't slide that's not so hard guys superficial is the most common type which we see with pharyngitis okay and rest is like uh, when the crypts are involved, it is follicular. When the crypts, they coalesce together and they become, you can say a little generalized, it looks like a membranous type, okay? It looks like a membrane, we call it as membranous. And when the parenchyma of the uh, tonsils is affected, so the tonsils, they become very big and red, okay? We call it as parenchymatous. Acute parenchymatous, right? So now, etiology. So th this lecture will not be so long because, you know, it is like a very easy topic. So <clears throat> as I told you, it mostly affects the school-going children. Okay. But it doesn't mean it, it cannot affect the adults. It can affect the adults as well. Okay. Hemolytic streptococci Cocos is the most common affecting organism and other causes of infection may be Staphylococci, Pneumococci, Haemophilus influenza, okay. Uh, and of course like one of the causes, uh, you know, which can cause tonsillitis is viral, okay. Viral type is or viruses are the most common cause as well. Why? Because uh, pharyngitis, right? So you can say 80% of the time, guys, you know, it is it is viral. Okay. What kind of viruses? Again, if there can be adenoviruses, there can be enteroviruses, there can be Kogzaki viruses, there can be EBV, uh, there can be cytomegalovirus, so all, all these viruses can cause, right? So, 80% of the time it is viruses and 20% of the time it is bacterial, bacteria, right? So, group A streptococcus, like, you know, hemolytic streptococcus, is also called as gas or group, group A streptococcus, right? You know, th this is the most common one in bacterial. So, you can say bacterial is... Uh, bacterial around uh, 20% right so all these bacteria can cause right so hemophilus influenza even Neisseria gonorrhea can cause you know in sexually active people they can have Neisseria gonorrhea so many many things can cause 
even fungal infections can cause guys but very 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 rare right so now <clears throat> once we have we know the etiology uh, and many of the times you know it the, the history goes like this way that is some sort of viral infection like adenovirus or whatever virus is causing tons like this later on you know there is secondary bacterial infection so it is very 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 common thing so what are the symptoms of tonsillitis? Now it's something so common that many people, they have experienced this thing. I don't think so. Like I, very, very few people are there, you know, who never, who never had the symptoms. So they had sore throat, um, dysphagia, uh, sorry, odenophagia. Odenophagia is like difficulty in swallowing because of pain. Of course, fever because it's an infection. So fever is a constitutional symptom, of course. Uh, and uh, and it could there could be earache because uh, of tonsillitis. There is uh, inflammation of what? Inflammation of the eustachian tube. And due to what? Like, you know, there is otitis media. So in children, otitis media can be there. So, uh, constitutional symptoms can be there like uh, headache, generalized body aches, malaise, constipation, okay, all, all these things can be there. Of course, like viral infections, you know, they give runny eyes, runny nose, headaches, myalgias, arthralgias, as well as lymphadenopathy can also occur. So, all these things can occur, of course not not so uncommon you can say very 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 common so what are the signs uh, of uh, this infection is uh, the patient they present with bad breath okay and of course like in signs we will ask the patient to open the mouth and uh, first of all you will take the vitals and you will found that the patient have fever uh, tachycardia can be there but once you will open the mouth maybe you will find a bad smell coming from the mouth as well as redness of the pillar soft pellet you will, uh, you will maybe you can find that the tongue is coated and uh, the swollen when you will see the tonsils you know uh, then you can find for example if the uh, tonsils are uh, just reddish in color so it could be acute superficial if you can see the yellow uh, yellow spots on the tonsils you can say follicular when you can say see a membrane on the tonsils you can say acute membranous and when you will see very much big tonsils which are meeting up in the middle kissing tonsils like both of the tonsils they are kissing each other it is called as parenchymatous right when you will examine the lymph nodes maybe you will found that the lymph nodes are swollen as well so uh, this is like how, how they present, right? So, now, uh, how we treat these patients is simp uh, simple. Uh, bed rest should be given if it's a viral infection. If they have pain, you can give them an give them some analgesics like paracetamol. Because it is like mostly in the kids. So, of course, paracetamol, no aspirin. Aspirin can give, cause rice syndrome. So, we can give them paracetamol, of course, the best drug, or ibuprofen can also be given. And if you're suspecting that, of course, like it's a bacterial infection, then you will go and start giving antibacterials. So, group A streptococcus is the most common one, and penicillins are the best drug which act against them. But the patients who are, who are allergic to penicillin, we can give them uh, macrolides to cover what you can say the atypical organisms like uh, erythromycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin, all these drugs. And if, for example, you know that the condition is not getting away by these conditions, these drugs, then of course we can go for some broad spectrum antibiotics like uh, amoxicillin with calavinic acid, you know, augmentin. So, cephalosporins, cephalosporins, 
uh, for those who are allergic to penicillins we can give them uh, macrolides uh, like uh, uh, erythromycin uh, azithromycin okay clarithromycin clarithro uh, rosithro so there are many what you can say uh, macrolides are there so uh, simple treatment is this one right and what are the complications guys simply you know they they can develop into chronic tonsillitis uh, and of course like due to repeated attacks you know and once you know that there is one attack and the infection is not completely uh, you can say gone and then there is a, one, one, one more what you can say uh, attack okay so they they can they can lead to chronic tonsillitis peritonsillitis tons tonsillar abscess can form which is called as quincy Parapharyngeal abscesses can form, cervical abscesses can form, acute otitis media can occur. Uh, group A beta hemolytic streptococcus if the infection is due to that, so you know, of course, it could be uh, rheumatic fever, but of course, like nowadays, it's not so common, it's like rare. And the complication of rheumatic fever can be acute glomerulonephritis or subacute bacterial uh, endocarditis, you know, these things can be there. So, uh, this is like to show the complication of what you can say the tonsillitis see the tonsil is so much enlarged that you know this is almost obstructing the airways right or oropharyngeal uh, connection right and this is like again a CT scan of the patient who have very 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 big tonsils So now uh, one of the things is differential di diagnosis of you know of the membrane over the tonsil. Uh, whenever anyone have membranous tonsillitis, you know, uh, we we can do a swab test, you know, for that just to see what kind of organism is there. Uh, for example, one of the thing is called as diphtheria, you know, uh, which is caused by corny bacterium diphtheria. Nowadays, it is very rare because, you know, we give the vaccination DPT to the patient babies. D is for diphtheria, P is for pertussis and T is for tetanus. So, DPT is a vaccine we can give them. We, we all give all the newborns. So, nowadays, you know, this infection is so rare that because, you know, because of vaccination. But uh, whenever, like, anyone who is unvaccinated, they, they get diphtheria, okay? So the membrane of diphtheria, it extends beyond the tonsils, like it also covers the soft palate and it is, the color of that membrane is basically, uh, you can say dirty gray color, okay, grayish white color or dirty gray color is over there, okay. And if we are going to try to remove that membrane, basically it causes bleeding, okay. Again, swab test can be done and we can diagnose this thing. So this thing is, this thing can be there, right. So, this is called as uh, fascial diphtheria, okay, which is caused by corny bacterium diphtheria. So, there are many other complications of tonsillitis, okay. Uh, secondary fungal infections can be there and all these things. One thing is called as Vincent angina. Uh, like uh, <clears throat> okay. so fossil I, I was talking about fossil diphtheria right uh, so most of the children you know who have this uh, diphtheria uh, <clears throat> what happens is like you know they have uh, uh, cuff episodes of cuff okay and uh, their cervical lymph nodes get enlarged and you know uh, sometimes you know they get too much swelling around the neck and if you don't treat nowadays it is very 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 uncommon okay so basically this diphtheria you know it releases exotoxin which is toxic to the heart and nerves okay so it can like one of the complications of diphtheria can be uh, myocarditis or cardiac arrhythmias okay but that's what we have a vaccination for that. 
so lymphadenopathy can occur child can you know uh, you can refuse to eat and investigation is again throat swab or check tests we can do and management is simply we we have to maintain the airways of course because uh, the airways is the most important thing because you know it can kill the patient if the patient cannot breathe okay so <clears throat> to kill the exotoxin you know uh, what is given is uh, we give them antitoxin we give them antitoxin antitoxin and antibiotics okay so <clears throat> antitoxin can be give uh, can can be given with antibiotics and antibiotics what kind of antibiotics penicillin is a very good and if penicillin like the patient cannot tolerate penicillin penicillin or is allergic to penicillin then you can choose uh, what you can say uh, macrolides same thing erythromycin azithromycin you can see you know this is diphtheria membrane can be seen so chronic tonsillitis guys what is the etiology of chronic tonsillitis again it is like one of the co uh, causes acute tonsillitis or repeated infections of acute tonsillitis okay or sometimes people have subclinical infection of tonsils and it mostly affect the children and young adults okay rarely it is seen in old people uh, and you can say chronic teeth infection can be like chronic auto odontogenic infections can one of the one of the predisposing feature or factor for chronic tonsillitis so again <clears throat> types of chronic tonsillitis is same chronic follicular tonsillitis when it is the cheesy material inside the crypts and chronic parenchymatous tonsillitis when like all the tonsils become enlarged okay and then there is chronic fibroid tonsillitis which is simply uh, like uh, the, there is fibrosis in the tonsils so the tonsils they appear very small okay and these are the people who have history of repeated sore throats so the clinical features is a recurrent sore, sore throats or acute tonsillitis attack there is chronic cough halitosis which is bad taste in mouth okay and bad breath foul breath why because there is pus in the crypts and because of that there is bad bad breath their speech become thick they have difficulty in swallowing. Sometimes they are choking spells at the night as well. So when you will examine the tonsils, of course, like if the tonsils is too much enlarged, you can found a kissing. We call it as kissing tonsil when they are meeting up in the middle. Okay. So some sometimes they meet in the midline. Which kind? Chronic parenchymatous. Okay. Sometimes you can see the yellowish color pus coming out from the each of the crypts so which type chronic follicular okay so and when you put the pressure on the on the tonsils you, you can express the pus out out of the crypts flushing of the anterior pillars can be seen and enlargement of juglodigastric lymph nodes can be seen again you can see over here this is surgically removed tonsils this is tonsils hidden in the tonsil pillars tonsils extending to the pillars Tonsils are, uh, tonsils are beyond the pillars and this one is tonsils extend to the midline what I'm saying is kissing tonsils so <clears throat> what is the treatment guys now uh, we must take care of their oral hygiene which is the most important thing okay treat an infection or co-infection like tooth infection they have and the ultimate treatment for this patient is of course tonsillectomy remove the tonsils okay and again what are the complex complications they remain same peritonsillar abscess which is also called as quincy parapharyngeal abscess intratonsillar abscess tonsilloliths like they, they are the stones or calculus of the tonsils and they are seen with the chronic tonsillitis okay because the, the crypts they are blocked and when they are blocked what happens is there is collection of the material inside their crypts and uh, the salts of calcium and magnesium they get deposited leading to formation of stones called as tonsillar tonsilloliths uh, tonsillar cyst can also occur of course okay so you can see over here this these are just like 
person have the chronic tonsillitis. This is one of the complication of tonsillitis. Cyst formation is there. Now the most important thing, guys, which why we are studying this thing is you know. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, is to know what you can say, what is the uh, uh, treatment for tonsils or tonsillectomy uh, and uh, uh, when we discuss tonsillectomy guys you know one of the important thing is to know um, what are the what are the uh, indications for tonsillectomy right uh, indications for tonsillectomy is very 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 important and that's how we decide like either the patient need any tonsillectomy okay or not so there are some absolute uh, indications there is some relative indication and then there are some tons tonsillectomy can can also be done as a part of other other surgery okay uh, so <clears throat> And tonsillectomy is a surgery, by the way, you know, which, which you will find most of the uh, ENT specialists, you know, they are performing this thing. Very, very, very common type of surgery, okay, which is performed uh, in these patients. So, <clears throat> the absolute indications for tonsillitis, okay, the absolute indications for tonsillitis, first of all, I will go for that, uh, is... Uh, Anyone who have recurrent tonsillitis, okay, and this is the most common indication you can say. So how they calculate is like anyone who have seven or more episodes in one year, or this is more than five episodes in for in two years, like five episodes per year for two years, three or more than three episodes per year for three years, and. Uh, Two or more than two weeks of lost work, school work, or either the person is working, you know, in a year. So, the most common cause or uh, the indication for tonsillectomy is recurrent infections, okay? Recurrent tonsillitis or recurrent infections. Peritonsillar abscess is like any children if uh, you can say is uh, tonsillectomy is done you know four to six weeks after abscess is formed in in the address we we wait for the second episode okay these are absolute indications abs absolute one of the absolute indication is febrile seizure you know in the babies if they have febrile seizures then there is hypertrophy of tonsils they are causing airway obstruction or difficult in eating or difficulty with speech or if you're sus su like suspecting malignancy in the in the in the patient so relative indications is like diphtheria then there is like someone who is streptococcal carrier uh, someone who have chronic tonsillitis with halitosis of bad taste okay or who is run responsible to medical treatment and number four is recurrent streptococcal tonsillitis in a patient with valvular disease and the last one is, you know, it is it can be done as a part of other, other surgery. For example, uh, many people, they have, you know, obstructive sleep apnea. While they sleep, you know, they, are, they have breathing problems. They have decrease in oxygen saturation. So, uh, most of these patients, they are obese, you know. So, tonsillectomy is done to relieve that. Or as a part of a surgery called as glossopharyngeal, glossopharyngeal neurectomy. So, to approach the glossopharyngeal nerve, you know, we have to remove the tonsil first because glossopharyngeal nerve, you know, it is in the bed of the tonsil or as a part of removal of styloid process, tonsillectomy is done. So, uh, what is, uh, how the tonsillectomy is done, guys, you know, again, uh, How the tonsillectomy is done, again, I would suggest you to see some, uh, what you can say, video for that. But mostly they don't go for tonsillectomy or 
A contraindication to undergo the tonsillectomy surgery is like anyone who have anemia and anyone who have active infection. Okay, anyone who have anemia, anyone who have active infection, children under three years of age. Okay, anyone who have cleft palate, anyone who have bleeding disorder. Okay. Tonsillectomy is not done. These are contraindication. So, I will explain you some of the procedure, but again, I will suggest you to watch some video. Whenever we have to remember in surgery about any procedure, you have to know a few things, you know, for example. Tonsillectomy is done under general anesthesia. Like, I have done, I have seen many of the tonsillectomies myself. So, tonsillectomy is done under general anesthesia, okay. And uh, <clears throat> in adults, you know, it can be done under local anesthesia, but mostly in general anesthesia. The position in which we put the patient is called as the rose position. Okay, like the patient is on the bed, their head is extended, and the pillow is basically placed under their shoulders, okay? So when the pillow is placed under, her, under their sh shoulders, like their, their head can go into more extension, okay? And to stabilize their head, you know, they put a rubber ring under the head. So, <clears throat> then there is a, what you can say, mouth gag is put on the, in the mouth, so that, you know, the mouth should be remain open. And uh, simply, that the tonsils, they are grabbed with the tonsil holding forcep and the incision is made in the mucous membrane in the from the anterior pillar side and then there is a curved scissor you know which is used to directly cut the tonsils from the peritonsillar tissue and separate its upper pole and then uh, like keep on holding the tonsil keep on giving pressure or a pull towards the medial side so they keep on cutting the tonsils and when the when the dissection is uh, complete so sometimes a wire loop is used you know or a something called as tonsillar snare. Tonsillar snare have a wire, a wire loop. So what they do, like they put a wire around that and you know, then they keep on tightening the wire and what happens like the pedicle, which is holding all the arteries, you know, is finally cut. After that, you know, they put a gauze inside that, that area from where they reduce the tonsils, they remove the tonsils and they, they put a pressure to stop the bleeding. And they, they maintain the pressure for a while, you know, so that the bleeding should be stopped. And then, of course, they observe the patient for a while because of what you can say, any complications. So this is how they do. And then we, when, you know, the patient is recovering, you know, they, they, keep, they, they give them soft diet, you know, they take care of the oral hygiene, all this stuff can be done. So, nowadays, by the way, laser tonsillectomies are also available, okay, and there are many other ways by which tonsillectomies are done. Remember, guys, there are complications of every surgery, and the most common surgery, you can say, uh, complication of tonsillectomy is hemorrhage, okay. Hemorrhage is very, very, very common type of uh, complication of tonsillectomy. So, there is something called as a reactionary hemorrhage as well. So, the bleeding which, which occur right after the tonsillectomy is called as primary hemorrhage and the bleeding which occur after tonsillectomy, 24 of hours after, you know, it is called as a reactionary hemorrhage, okay? So, if that thing occurs, you know, they can apply some vasoconstrictors to stop the bleeding. So, rest, you know, damage to the adjoining structures can occur. Teeth can get injured, aspiration can occur, aspiration of blood can occur, and all the things can occur, okay? So, sometimes the hemorrhage can occur after 24 hours, it's called a secondary hemorrhage, okay? But usually it is seen between 5th to 10th post-operative day. Infections can occur, and all the things, right? They can occur as a complication of what you can say. Uh, don't select me. So when you will see tonsillectomy, guys, you know, whenever they remove tonsillectomy, tonsils, 
many of the times what they do is like they they remove adenoids as well they shave adenoids as well okay so like that's why it is most of the time it is called as uh tonsillo adenoid adenoidectomy okay so <clears throat> that, that is a very simple procedure by the way like you can see tonsils removal and adenoid shaving uh, procedure you know uh, on youtube i think like that would be better for you guys like you will develop a good concept like how they do the surgery how they cut it okay of course like nowadays uh, what's written in the books you know nowadays new techniques are available uh, by which they do these kind of surgeries okay so simply <clears throat> uh, whenever they remove tonsils you know they they also remove what you can say uh the adenoids right so now uh, one of the complication i told you it is peritonsillar abscess you know which is also called as quincy okay it is also called as quincy as you can see it is a collection of pus between fibrous capsule of the tonsil usually at its upper pole and the superior constrictor muscle of the pharynx you can see over here inflamed tonsils and someone who have abscess see uvula is pushed on one side and tonsil is so much big so <clears throat> types is anterior posterior lingual and tonsillar but uh, what is the etiology uh, of course of tonsillitis you know this can occur the pus can be there so when the crib the, there is infection in the crypts you know so sometime it can get sealed off and of course like there is a intra tonsillar abscess can form which basically can burst towards the capsule the capsule of tonsils and can make abscess over there so it is also called as peritonsillar abscess or it can also cause peritonsillitis so <clears throat> uh, it is more common in males recurrent tonsillitis foreign body embedded in the tonsils tonsillar tag left behind after tonsillectomy the most common organisms which when we when we see uh, when we when we examine their what you can say the tonsils uh, the most common organism which will found is streptococcus pyogenes streptococcus aureus and anaerobic organisms so now uh, anyone who have peritonsillar um, this is the pathophysiology i was talking about so guys you know this kind of this peritonsillar abscess it most of the time affect the adults rare it is very rare in the children okay and it is usually unilateral could be bilateral but usually unilateral so the clinical features like general symptoms are there of course like whenever there is abscess you know people present with fever uh, and high grade fever with chills and rigors headache and of course they will they, they complain of pain in throat they have painful swelling now in the in the neck there is a big masses there they have a muffled and thick speech we also call it as hot potato voice and they have foul breath due to of course pus in the oral cavity okay and they may have what you can say ear ache because of eustachian tube is blocked so when you examine these patients what you will found the vitals you will found the fever okay and uh, the patient is ill looking they have pyrexia when you will check their tonsils what you will found is tonsils are enlarged soft palate <clears throat> will be congested swollen okay uvula is pushed onto the other side it is swollen as well uh you can found like uh, pus is coming out maybe you can found that thing we will found lymphadenopathy one thing you'll found maybe is tortico torticollis like the patient basically you will found th these patients you know their head head is tilted or neck is tilted to the side of abscess right because to relieve the pressure on the abscess so if the if the abscess is on this side as you can see over here this is uvula 
So see all this area have abscess. So their head will be tilted on this side. Okay, the same side where there is pus. So this is how the patients present. Okay. And complication is simply there could be parapharyngeal abscess and phallibitis of the internal jugular veins, septicemia, hemorrhage, subglottic edema. Treatment, guys, remember one thing, you know, whenever there is abscess, only treatment is drainage. You can see, you know, the pus inside the thing. So simply put them in the ED or hospital. If they are dehydrated, give them IV fluids, give them antibiotics. Of course, to cover both aerobic as well as anaerobic organisms. Um, give them painkillers, paracetamol or ibuprofen. And uh, the only treatment is IND. What is IND? It is incision and drainage. Whenever there is abscess, remember, we have to drain that. Except even the abscess in the brain should be drained. Except, ex except the abscess in the anterior chamber of the eye. So... So how to do that you know when we examine you can we can found that the area of the maximum bulging or sometimes sometimes we found a white spot okay so we we make a small incision you can say okay so we can make a small incision or a small stab inside that thing okay uh, and of course like we can put a force up in that small uh, stab open it the pus will started coming out now be sure that the pus should not go inside the mouth in the in the stomach but simply that's why you can see they have the syringe to collect the pus okay and one more thing guys you know uh, if someone have quincy or abscess uh, tonsillectomy should be done when the Infection is gone around four to six weeks after the quincy is gone or solved. One thing is called as hot tonsillectomy as well. So that is called as interval tonsillectomy. Okay, if when we do tonsillectomy four to six weeks after quincy, it is called as interval tonsillectomy. There is something called as abscess or hot tonsillectomy as well or quincy tonsillectomy. Uh, what is that like? Many people, they say like instead of giving them incision and drain the abscess, okay, just remove the tonsils. But of course, there is a risk of increased bleeding whenever there is infection because whenever there is infection, you know, simply the, there is more blood supply in that area and when more blood supply is in that area, so of course, there could be more bleeding. So there could be retropharyngeal abscess, paravertebral abscess and... Uh, all these areas can have abscesses, but Quincy is the most important one, which is the peri, which is also called as a peri tonsillar abscess. Okay, so interval tonsillectomy and hot tonsillectomy. I told you about adenoids when hypertrophied nasopharyngeal tonsil starts producing symptoms, the condition is referred to as adenoids. Okay. So the normal involution of phrasopharyngeal tonsil starts from the onset of puberty, but sometimes it can persist for a longer time. And the, ton the adenoids are over here. At this place, this place, right? So this is a nasal cavity. So they will... Uh, so what they do, like they shave them off, right? They shave them off. Again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a photograph of someone who have tonsillectomy. Oh, sorry, tonsillitis, right? And very huge type of tonsils, like they are almost meeting in the middle, and their airway, they, his airway is almost compromised. So you can say this is an example of kissing tonsils, right? So that's all about tonsillitis, guys. It's a very, 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 very important topic. Quincy is very important, and in tonsillitis, acute tonsillitis is more important. Uh, tonsillectomy is very important. Uh, to know the indication of tons tonsillectomy are, is very important as well. So, hope you uh, understand the lecture. Okay, understand the condition. And 
like whenever we suspect any bacterial infection of course we go for antibiotics so even after incision drainage we will go go and give it we will we will start the patient with antibiotics so thank you so much guys for listening